It's a special edition of US of Ed this week. Usually former Washington insider Ed Blakely and myself, Sean Britton, talk about all the happenings of the week in US news and politics. This episode, however, in honour of the 50th anniversary of the Martin Luther King Jr. assassination, Ed and I decided to sit down and talk about his experiences with King himself and the March on Washington, as well as issues facing black Americans today. As always, you can find us on iTunes, Wooshka, Facebook and Twitter at US of Ed. Ed, I don't want to say we're sick of talking Trump, but this week we are doing something a little bit different. We're looking at the United States for black Americans. And this is the right week to do it. That's exactly right. 50 years today since uh, Martin Luther King's assassination. Now, first off, the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King, for a lot of us, this is now a part of history, but it didn't actually occur all that long ago, really. Ed, you were a young man around the time of the civil rights movement. What is your memory of it? Let's put this in context. I'm a contemporary of Martin Luther King. I was an adult. Martin Luther King's only eight years older than me. Mm -hmm. So if he were still alive, he'd only be 88 years old probably not even eligible to get in a retirement home. Uh, he was a young man when he died. And think what he, he did before he died. Uh, Martin Luther King came up into a prominent family in Atlanta. His father was the pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church, the biggest Baptist church in Atlanta for black people, in one of the most prestigious, prestigious neighborhoods uh, in the city for black people. So he didn't come into this world as some poor kid. He followed his father's footsteps. And I met Martin Luther King uh, several times, but always in the same way. He was giving a talk, a speech, or preaching. I first met Martin Luther King when he was preaching in Los Angeles, raising money for the movement. And he was just another guy. The big guys at that time were Stokely Carmichael and Andrew Young and John Lewis. These were the big guys. This little short guy, he wasn't one of the big guys. But when he opened his mouth, you could tell he was well-educated. He could quote Homer and Cicero and Shakespeare and all this, but bring it all together to make a really great message. So by the time Selma happened and the marches were going on, remember there were people who led up to that. Um, there was a, uh, the sit-ins uh, in the drugstores. There's Rosa Park who would not sit in the back of the bus. So the movement had started before Martin Luther King got started. And there were two branches of this movement. One was the Malcolm X branch. Take us back to Africa or give us a state of our own. And I met Malcolm X when I was just when I finished university. And I was pretty convinced he was right. And then there was the integration movement led by King and others, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And those were Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So Malcolm X was a Muslim. So there was a sharp divide there. You had to choose. Most, uh, we were coloreds in those days. I've gone from being colored to being a Negro to being black to being African American. So... You know, I'm almost like a person who's gone through sex changes. <laughs> um, and each of these are fairly dramatic moves. At any rate, uh, when I met Martin Luther King uh, in Selma, and that's when I got my first impression of him, I uh, was at a church one evening, and he was one of the preachers. He wasn't the only preacher. Uh, Reverend Abernathy was the big name on the board. But he was leading the march. Uh, so... He gave a speech that sounded like a commencement speech to the university. And the speech went something like this. You must have a plan for your life. 
And that plan must include the Lord. But more importantly, that plan must include a good education. It must include being a great father or mother. It must include raising a great family and so on. It was the kind of speech you get in the commencement. Here we're going to go out the next day in a battle. But by the time he finished, he was saying to us, you now have the strength to go to that battle because you're going to have a plan and nobody's going to conquer you like a football coach. The next day I went in the battle. I think I was in the battle for about 20 seconds because I got hit by a baton. Now, it wasn't all my fault. If that young lady hadn't been so pretty, I would have had my head turned in the right direction. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, in a sense, having a wound like a soldier makes you more spirited of a soldier uh, in the war. You want to get back into combat. And so I went. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, Martin Luther King was our leader through that combat. But there are other leaders, including Robert uh, Kennedy, uh, who were leading the movement. Um, there were uh, leaders from the labor unions who were leading the movement. Uh, and Martin Luther King became the pivotal figure. Martin Luther King was the first leader of the black community that black people chose. Prior to that, uh, Carver, Washington Carver, was chosen by white people. W.D. Du Bois, chosen by white people to be our leader. But Martin Luther King was chosen by black people to be the leader from a group of other good people, as I mentioned before. <clears throat> he was a teacher and a preacher. I would say, and this is in the Easter season, he's a bit more like Jesus. You know, turn the other cheek. That was not a message that a lot of people wanted to hear. They wanted to say, hey, can we get our guns? Uh, so he, the Nehru uh, um, Gandhi orientation was not the orientation of most of the black leaders. And he took that orientation of Gandhi and started leading people and led us through a terrible time. Uh, he got... Um, Kennedy first to start uh, the Civil Rights Act, and Johnson finished it off. Maybe if he had, well, he the Civil Rights Act had been signed, but the implementation had not really occurred, and he was known to have been the person to lead that. And the I Have a Dream, which two hundred thousand people in Washington, white people were scared to death, and black people were feeling powerful. Uh, but then the wheels started coming off that train and uh, some whites uh, never forgave him and some blacks benefited from it, including myself. And those who benefited from it forgot those who didn't benefit from it. So it was a very difficult time in America and black America is still fragmented from it. Mm. In fact, I know from conversations I've had with other black Americans, there still is that feeling of division really between those two camps of Martin Luther King, turn the other cheek, we will achieve these things by peaceful protest, and the legacy of Malcolm X, uh, which was a legacy that did call for armed revolution and indeed going back to Africa, as you mentioned there. Well, Black Lives Matter is a Malcolm X movement. It goes right back to Malcolm X. Uh, now, they haven't taken up guns, but they've certainly stopped traffic. They've uh, disrupted the nation. So that's one group, and that group is still around. But there's still a lot of uh, blacks who are in positions of leadership uh, who want integration and are fighting for it. You mentioned, of course, the March on Washington. I must admit the other week when we were talking about the uh, March for Our Lives, which was such a huge protest in Washington, D.C., I had to keep uh, catching myself not to say the uh, the March on Washington. That kind of movement, that kind of energy that was seen in that day, that kind of, well, as you mentioned, the really physical aspect of it that had a lot of white folks really, really nervous seeing this enormous uh, crowd of of blacks moving into Washington, D.C., saying, we are here, we are demanding these rights. That kind of legacy today, I haven't seen that sort of same movement for black people, I guess, be harshly because of that, that fragmentation that you mentioned. There. Yes, uh, but remember, in uh, 1964, I think that speech was given, or 63, 
a lot of blacks couldn't find a hotel room in Washington, D.C. Now, a lot of blacks own the hotels in Washington, (laughs) D.C. And and I'm not joking about that. At one point, uh, when I moved to New York, uh, in about 1999-2000, the heads of every major financial institution was an African-American. American Express, Citibank, it's all black Americans. Even today, the chief of IBM is a black woman. So some people zoomed. They missed the middle and went right to the top, Condoleezza Rice. I knew I was at Berkeley. She was another staff member at Stanford. Uh, We both did all right. I'm not going to (laughs) say that I finished on the bottom, but Condoleezza Rice... um, was at Stanford and and known to be a good person. And she, I believe she was provost at Stanford uh, when I left Berkeley. But I certainly never expected her to be Secretary of State of the United States. Uh, I'm not saying she's ordinary, but, <laughs> <clears throat> you know, some, some blacks who, who would be in my category would say, well, why not me? Uh, but the bigger thing is if you go to Main Street, in Los Angeles, uh, think of uh, coming out on Broadway and from the train station almost all the way to the university, there are people living on the street and they are black. 90% of them are black. Uh, let's say almost all of them have some substance abuse. And um, you kind of wonder about that. What happened? Let me give you my theory, of it, if you don't mind. My theory of it was that W.E. Du Bois talked about the talent of the 10th. We created over 100 black colleges and universities. The talented people in the ghetto went to those universities or non-segregated states to the unsegregated universities. What did they do? They worked as social workers, as teachers, as chemists, as lawyers, as doctors for the black community. When the civil rights movement came, all of a sudden they had white clients and they could teach in white schools and black kids who were talented could go to white universities in the South, leaving behind those people who were not university prepared, unable to really cope for themselves. And that is the situation today. The talented people have left the ghetto, and the ghetto has rotted because you left behind everyone who didn't have the capacity to do those things. Um, One of my uncles used to say, remember when the slaves came over, those are slaves on the top of the boat and those at the bottom, and that's the way it has been. Unfortunately, those of us who are in the middle of the deck or at the top of the deck have not reached back to help somebody else on the bottom. Um, many, many people say, well, the Italians made it coming to America well after the blacks. The French, the Irish, you name them, they all made it. Two things about that. If you came from Italy, you came from a country. Black person didn't know what country they came from. It's like not having a father or a mother. You came from an organized place. Uh, the first banks in California were the Bank of Italy, the Bank of Slovenia. So you brought institutions with you. Even here, the Lebanese came here and they start banks. Money coming from Lebanon. Uh but when the blacks come from Africa, there's no black African bank. So, and I'm not saying that blacks won't make it here, but when you've been a slave, that's a harder pull. Uh, so we've left people behind. When you go to Latin America, you see the same thing, that the African slaves in Brazil are still the bottom of the social ladder, even though there's never been any real discrimination there. Color counts. Uh, you go to Saudi Arabia and countries like this. My first trip to Saudi Arabia, I was surprised to see how many really black African people. And what were they doing? They were sweeping the floors. They weren't crown princes. So the color 
is consequential, but also access to wealth. Uh, African Americans, if you take the Malcolm X route, would have started and owned the banks, not worked for them. Would have kept the black colleges and universities in place. When the best black athletes had scholarships, they would have gone to black schools. That was Malcolm X's notion. Don't go to the white school. Go to the black school. Uh, the other route was, you know, W. Du Bois was a Harvard graduate. So this tension is still in America, and we should talk about that. Absolutely. Some very powerful words there. I did want to touch, before we move on to some of the issues, uh, you know, across the board, a man you know quite well, Barack Obama, around the hype of the 2008 election, a lot of people looked at him like, this is the great black hope. Uh, I think a lot of people of my vintage would see him as a Martin Luther King-esque figure, and yet he was ultimately a politician. He was a president. He had to represent all Americans, not just black Americans, something I think he did rather successfully for all Americans, but I think his legacy when it comes to black Americans is a source of much greater debate. What do you make of Obama as a leader for black Americans, as uh, Yes We Can as a movement for black Americans? Well, first of all, Obama wasn't a black American. Obama was an African American, true enough, but he had no history of the Americas in his blood. His father was a Nigerian, and his mother had Swedish blood. Uh, he lived outside the United States most of his life. And I include Hawaii as being outside. It wasn't even a state. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he lived in Indonesia. He came back, went to Occidental and Harvard. He never experienced black America in his whole life. Uh, he might have driven through a ghetto, and when he was in Chicago, I'm sure he walked through a few, enough to get elected to the state Senate and later on uh, to the U.S. Senate. Uh, so, and even they, in his books, he says, I can't represent black America, and white people are making me the representative of black America, not black people. Black people never made Obama their representative. Had he been Martin Luther King, I surely tell you there would have been a very different America, not just for blacks, because he had the issue of poverty in his soul. His third most important speech, and I wrote a book from it, is called The Two Americas. And he was talking about poor whites and poor blacks who were being torn apart by the Industrial Revolution. And he said that will destroy the nation. Now that sounds like Donald Trump, doesn't it? Um, so the, the issue for black Americans with Obama is how do I get a hold of him when he doesn't know about me? And we're glad to have him there, but he is a prisoner of the whites, not a leader of the blacks, a very big difference. Uh, and as you know, I know Barack Obama, I've had, uh, very good relationships with him. The first time I really met him uh, was in New Orleans. And let me give you a little story about that. I um, am the director of recovery in New Orleans. I've been there for one week. But I had developed a plan. And Barack Obama comes, along with the senator from Connecticut, uh, and our senior citizen, uh, 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 senator, um, Landrew, and they have the big motorcades and the buses and all this. And uh, my chauffeur uh, takes me uh, through the lines up to the bus, and I get on the bus. And Senator Landrew says, "Who are you?" And I said, "I'm the director of recovery." And she says, "I, what's your name?" And I told her, Ed Blakely. She said, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The mayor told me about you. You've only been here about a week." You don't know nothing. So she walks off the bus. And um, uh, Senator um, uh, from uh, Connecticut uh, walks off the bus. And Barack stayed on the bus. And he says, what have you got to say? And I pulled out my maps and started going through my pan, plan. And some staff person ran and says, there's a press conference coming. He says, no, I have to listen to the director. 
So he sat with me for about 10 minutes or so. And uh, then we walk off the bus, escorted off over to the press conference. And Landrew's waving to him to come over and he continues to talk to me. And then as he sits by, uh, over to talk to him, he says, no white woman's going to diss a black man in my presence. Thank you, Dr. Blakely. Now, looking at some of the issues facing black America, I want to expand on something you were speaking about last week. Police brutality is one of the most visible issues facing black Americans. Whether it's visible enough or not, I uh, I can't tell you. But certainly it's one of the most talked about issues of the moment. Uh, last week you said that black Americans are facing an intimidation force, not a police force. Would you mind expanding on that? Yes. Um, for all black Americans, uh, an encounter with the police, there's a potential for violent action. Uh, there is never a time when you see a police figure, particularly a white policeman, as a possibility of a good thing, that they're going to give you directions. or there's, Every time there's a potential of them uh, throwing you against your car, you know, the whole bit. And it doesn't matter whether you're driving a new car or an old car, what neighborhood you're in. And if you're in a white neighborhood and you're a black person in an old car, you are in very bad trouble. If you're a black person in a very new car, uh, it, it's it's quite intimidating. Uh, LeRon James, who lives in uh, Brentwood, which is one of the most exclusive areas in the city, has had the police stop him as he's turning into his own driveway. Like, Who's this black man going into that house? <laughs> and then, of course, when they see him, whoa. But a white driver would not be get that at all. And LeDron's afraid that his kids, as they grow up and they're teenagers running around that neighborhood, is going to be a dangerous place rather than the kind of safety he had intended. So the police force has been the group, and I'm not discounting black policemen as well as white, to control the potential of violent folks. And violent folks, ergo, are black people. Uh, this notion is so deep in American culture that black policemen, and remember their experience with most blacks since they deal with criminals, are black people are criminals. So the whole experience is one where criminality and black are associated. Uh, Seventy percent of the people in American pr prisons are, let's say, they're African American. That means they might be come from Africa and they're in America or they're black American. Seventy percent of the whole prison population. It's the second largest prison population in the world. So the guards are black. At least half of them, maybe more. Uh, one of my cousins ran one of the prisons. He's now retired. But his experience was that the people in the prison were black people who were breeding more criminals. So his experience was that these black men, in part because they were cut off from society, if you put you have a prison record on a job application, that means you're not going to get the job. So what's your next job? Stealing something. So it's this perpetuating itself. Uh, one would say, and I'm one of those who says, the black community is at fault, but not the cause. So the black community, I think, should behave like the Jewish community. Take care of your own. Or like the Mormons, take care of your own. Start your own institutions. Use your own power. Black economic power is enormous. And Martin Luther King used it. The boycotts. But couldn't that same power start an insurance company that whites and blacks went to? Start a... Uh, could he, they, you could even start a separate exchange for black companies. The black population is that large. Black consumers 
are among the most important consumers in the United States. Black consumers are bigger than Canada and Mexico combined economically. But in a sense, you're furthering it away by not buying black. Now, Trump talks about buying American. There are still people talking about buying black. I want to talk to you about uh, some of that economic aspect. Uh, just expanding on that, one of the root causes of crime we know is poverty. Of all the ethnic groups in the United States, blacks have the highest percentage of individuals living in poverty. Hispanics come in second after that. Now, it's something like 27%. But with black children under six, almost half of black children under six are living in poverty situations. Why? Well, there are two reasons for that. No male. No breadwinner. Okay? Uh, that puts you in poverty. And being a single mother, almost no matter where you come from, you're in poverty. Uh, because you don't have that two income, the double income. Uh, that wasn't as pernicious as it is today. Uh, if you go back to Martin Luther King's day, a black woman, uh, and usually she'd live at home with her mother, could raise a child because there was enough money coming in from the welfare check, plus mother worked for some white people, and they combined that, and they lived in the ghetto, so it wasn't expensive. So they could raise a child, and you can hear you hear plenty of stories of these great athletes who came up in families like that where there was mama and grandmother. And that's interesting because it takes two people to raise a child. The children are in trouble, don't have grandma. Uh, so uh, in black America, again, one has to ask, uh, why aren't other black males stepping forward? I had a couple of uncles uh, who joined an organization uh, that was designed, the Big Brother organizations, to be parents to kids who didn't have uh, a father in the home. Uh, and they did an outstanding job. Some of these young men are now in important jobs, judges, lawyers, and so forth. Not because they gave the family money. They were just around and steered the kid in the right direction and kept the woman from choosing the wrong partner which is super duper important. Um, going a little bit farther on this, a black woman who's in poverty isn't there with one child. She's usually there with three or four with different fathers who abandoned her. Now, one would think you'd learn the first time, but unless you got a strong grandma or someone else in your life, you don't. So this is a huge problem. It's an increasing problem for white America. As the divorce rate has gone up, it's gone up in a very strange way. A woman who gets divorced or who doesn't get married the first time chooses bad men going up the ladder. And so we have now, and I just read a thing about this, the number of white young men who are stranded and who are now ending up in drug clinics and so forth has skyrocketed. And they trace it back to the fact that their mothers had no decent man in their lives. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's kind of when the drug problem first started in America, and it was pretty much black, a black problem. Blacks were taking drugs. And one of my aunts said, you know, if the bottom of the tree rots, the whole tree rots. So the drug thing is now almost bigger in the white community with ice and the like. Uh, so again, the intervention has to be at the beginning of life. We know that now about the brain. We know that about everything. And if you don't have those interventions early in life, you can't make any corrections later. What's government policy have to do with that? Well, one government policy that um, Clinton fixed and it's being unfixed now is if there was a male in the house where a woman had a child, her welfare was reduced. The notion was to give the male incentive to go and work. Well, what the males did is they left the house. So the welfare check would go up. Now, who came up with the first policy? Really stupid. But then <clears throat> another professor who became very controversial proposed, 
Let's move this in a different direction. If a male goes in the house and has a job that is under the median wage, let's top it up to the median wage. They ran this experiment first in New Jersey. It was enormously successful, and everything changed. The kids did better in school, da-da-da-da-da. But as soon as the Republicans got back in, what's the first program they cut out? And what's the program? The program for uh, food and so forth for underprivileged children. What's that program? That program is being cut out to support the tax cuts. So you reap what you sow. And if you're going to plant bad stuff, it's sooner or later going to break America. I just briefly want to touch on this one uh, when we are discussing this issue. The rate of unemployment for black Americans, it's fallen to its lowest level in decades. It's around 6.8% unemployment compared to 41 across the board. Trump has tried to take credit for this one. Uh, after all, his pitch to black Americans for the 2016 election was, what do you got to lose under me? Uh, what's your take on him sort of trying to step in and say, this is down to me? Well, everyone's unemployment is down. <clears throat> and when unemployment goes down uh, for white Americans, it actually goes down for black Americans because black people work for white people. So if white people now have income, that surplus income goes for hiring child care workers and things like this. Also, government expands and blacks get government jobs as teachers and the like. On the lowest end of the scale, <clears throat> two things have happened. One, a lot of blacks are in jail. So they don't count in the unemployment. The other thing that's helped blacks is the gig economy. It sounds strange, doesn't it? But a lot of short order cooks and things now work and drive Ubers and have jobs in the tech industry doing it's fairly menial but substantial jobs. So even in my own family, some of the young people who haven't finished university, and we hope they will, have all these gigs. They work here in a brewery. They work in this and they work in that. Because if you walk around America, there's self-wanted signs everywhere. And the color barrier has been broken. In the past, blacks couldn't get those jobs. And whites didn't want them. But now, working in a pool hall, working, uh, serving people, doing this or that, coffee shops and things like that. In New York City, uh, the guys on the street who are giving you the donuts and the coffee are either Latinos or blacks. So that accounts for it. But when you look at skilled unemployment, it's still very high for blacks. So blacks with a college degree... <clears throat> don't get the same jobs that whites with a college degree get, even in the same fields, except engineering. Because an engineer is an engineer, really, and medicine. A doctor is a doctor. Uh, but other than that, whites make more than blacks. So it's not just unemployment. It's a wealth gap. The median income for whites in America is about $130,000 a year which is nothing here in Australia. The median income for blacks is about $60,000 a year, less than half of the white. And you say, well, why is that? Because the white is the principal of the school and the black is the teacher. So the, the differences, unemployment's gone down, but the differences between employment haven't changed. And one more thing about this. White Americans who are unprepared have worse chances than black Americans who are prepared. Whereas if you're a white American who used to work in a factory in a coal mine, you have no unemployment opportunity to look forward to. A black American who finished community college can work at the post office, and you can't. So this is making a lot of whites very angry because in the past they didn't have to compete with blacks or Latinos. This border issue is a really a figment of imagination. Latinos leave America when there are no jobs. With this low unemployment rate, that means 
Moms can't file child care. There's no one to cut the lawn. The Latinos are not there to receive welfare. They can't get welfare. You can't get welfare here unless you have a visa. If you haven't got a visa, you can't get anything except working in the cash economy and living in groups. Uh, Latinos who cross the border are the least likely people in America to commit crime. Makes sense, right? Because if the cops catch you, you get deported. So there was one guy who shot someone in San Francisco. Horrible incident. And he was a person who was the, the catch and release program. And he hadn't done anything bad, but he was out on bail. And a man who'd not committed any crimes before shot off a gun, hit a young white girl from the Midwest, killed her. He's used as an example of how dangerous Hispanics are. Now, how many Hispanic terrorists have there been? Not a lot, considering how many uh, you might see crossing the borders. You don't exactly see them committing these kind of uh, mass acts. Zero. Yeah. How many black terrorists have you heard of? Zero. There was one in Washington, D.C., uh, a Navy guy who got very upset like this woman uh, yesterday uh, at YouTube. Uh, now, you could say that's an act of terrorism because she happens to have a Middle Eastern you know, Lebanese name or something like this. She was just pissed off. Uh, and uh, you were a vegan terrorist? Please. Big, mind, mind you, Hitler was a vegetarian, so... Yeah, so... Um, <laughs> but but the point here is, we now have a different situation, and I want to make this clear to our listeners. The white unemployed person is a real danger in America. The black un or underemployment person isn't because the expectations are so different. So a black who has any kind of employment is feeling okay. A white who has any kind of employment who's working at the Toys R Us or whatever, or the Walmart, is feeling, this nation let me down. It's a very big difference. And I've talked to some of these whites. Uh, it's interesting, I fly across America and one of these budget airlines, and I'll be on one of them. And I'll sit next to some white people, and they'll ask me what I do, and I tell them. They say, wish my kids had gone to school like you, and things had turned out for them like you. But there's a little bit of Regret and anger. And they're always thinking, I got it in school when their kids didn't. Their kids probably didn't even apply. And so there's the notion that blacks are able to get into universities easier, get jobs easier than whites. What's the element of this? Affirmative action. Affirmative action says if you have a choice between a woman, a black, or a white male, and they're all equally qualified, you give exponents for the white uh, woman or the black compared to the white male. So white males have gone into certain professions, uh, particularly in finance, you go into these finance shops, you don't see any blacks. They are all there, you know, the the dealers and so forth are all whites. Now, if you go to the bank next door, the vice president of the bank is black. <laughs> so, so, so there's still this kind of economic segregation, but in a different way. And, and the low income uh, white isn't going to go to work in a trading house. So they're really stuck. The coal mine that they kept blacks from has allowed the black people to live longer. We now have declining um, mortality rate for white males in America because when they reach from their 50s, they are laid off and they haven't saved much money. So they are angry people. So the anger in America, Trump really represented, but it is anger from blacks. Uh, blacks have insulated themselves from Trump. If if Trump, and they've tried this, uh, tried to touch college admissions and things, which they tried to roll back, uh, using, you know, blacks as 
uh, having the extra exponents and so forth. The courts knock it down. So it hasn't been successful there. Um, and I remind my relatives when we meet and their grand houses in Southern California or North Carolina, or so they all seem to have big pools and grand houses, and they're very good middle-class people, sound very much like Republicans, that black people that are going to make it have to do it just like I did. And I say BS. You made it going to a public university. You got a job in the public sector. You didn't make it. Martin Luther King made it. And you got a chance. Obviously, we were talking about Martin Luther King, the civil rights movement uh, a little bit earlier. Before I did let you go, I did want to talk to you a little bit about maybe one of the big results out of that era, voting rights. Yes. Uh, The Voting Rights Act of 1965 was meant to overcome a great deal of barriers at different levels of government that kept black Americans from exercising their right to vote. Now, some have actually said new legislation proposed by Republicans in this day and age around voter identification is aimed at keeping poorer Americans, in particular black Americans, out of the democratic process. So before I did let you go, I did want to, just want to get your thoughts on the role of black Americans in the democratic process right now. Yeah, um, uh, there have been uh, a lot of these uh, voter identification things coming up. Trump says this keep non citizens out, uh, but it's really aimed at, at depressing the black vote because having a driver's license, having all these different kinds of things, proving that you live in the residence with a light bill and all this kind of stuff is really aimed at depressing the black vote. The black vote is the critical vote. So if you can depress it, you're going to. Uh, Fortunately, there are enough blacks who are lawyers now and so on that these things have been overturned in practically every state. The other thing is, and this is something people have not focused on, African Americans have become the people who are running the elections in the South. So the person who's in charge of elections uh, in Mississippi is black. The deputy in Alabama is black. So you heard the state attorney general saying, we're going to do the count and all this is a white man. But the guy standing behind him is the guy that does the count and he's black. This is a part of Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King says, get the jobs that count. Don't just run for public office. You can buy a person in public office. Take the job that determines who's in public office. I'll never forget his speech on this. And I'm like, well, what are you talking about? He says, somebody has to run the polls. Wow. Somebody has to be the judge on the court. Wow. Be the gatekeeper. So increasingly, black Americans are taking the less visible but very important jobs that will shape the destiny of elections and the like. Uh, black Americans, and I have several um, cousins uh, who are this, they are the chief of admissions at very important universities. They could have been the lead professor, but be chief of admission is far more important. So I think this voting thing is really uh, something that uh, white Republicans have to be very... Uh, frightened by because they have lost the educated people. And white males, as I said before, are dying out. They're dinosaurs. So what we have a situation in the United States is where the white males have to have a new message. And it better come soon. Just before I do let you go, any final words, any final, uh, particularly solutions to some of these ones that we've raised? I think there are a couple of things, um, and these are radical solutions, uh, and I propose them in a book called Separate Societies. The first is stop making race-based laws. Uh, the United States needs a minimum wage for everybody, a Social Security system for everybody, a national health system for everybody. 
remove the uh, discriminatory impact of admissions to schools and universities. Uh, the United States still has small school districts that are dominated by whites. Make all schools state schools like here in Australia so that you don't have some group that forms a club and calls it a school district. So these are things I learned from King. These are not original ideas. That the solution for black America is the solution for all of America. So we propose, uh, for example, uh, much, and we have this in Australia, national wages for occupations. That would mean if a black was in it, they wouldn't be poor. Now, if you're serving coffee in Mississippi, you don't have enough money to rent. But if you're serving coffee in New York, you can buy an apartment. So, uh, and that's a super exaggeration. But my point is, here in this country, by having a national wage, it's had to make a huge difference. Now, there are people who are sleeping in the street, but it isn't because of the national wage. So if we had national wages in America, if we had national programs, uh, I think every kid uh, that comes from uh, a family, uh, well, first of all, before they're born, Hawaii has a law that a woman who does not announce a father when she comes to the hospital and is pregnant gets a state-appointed grandma. Now, this sounds like something that Hitler would do. This has been one of the most successful programs in the state. It has pushed down poverty in Hawaii because these grandmas become the grandma for the young woman and getting the wife. Many of them are white. Many of them are Japanese with uh, children who are mixed race. But these kids end up like Obama because they're in a better family situation. So I think radical solutions for everybody, because this program doesn't say black women, Chinese women, if you show up without a daddy or a grandma, we're going to give you one. And these programs are successful, programs that are generally applicable. So Australia has a lot to be proud of. Uh, and that's why more people here become successful no matter where they come from because the bottom is so high. Thanks for listening to this special edition of US of Ed.